This section of chapter 14 is going to cover the secondary assessment. The traditional approach to forming a diagnosis or a field diagnosis on a patient is done so by a differential diagnosis. What this means is you develop a mental thought of potentially what could be wrong with the patient based on their signs and symptoms. Once you have a mental thought of potential reasons that could be causing the patient's current condition, as you take vital signs, do interventions, things like that, you can begin to rule things out. For instance, the unresponsive patient. You can be thinking, well, maybe it's drugs, it's alcohol, maybe um, they've had a stroke, maybe it was because of seizures, things like that. Maybe it's low blood pressure, low blood sugar. And as you go and begin to assess the patient, get more vital signs, you can start scratching things off those lists. So next, we'll watch a video on forming a differential diagnosis. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to take my temperature. Are you monitoring your circadian rhythms in order to identify your periods of maximum mental acuity? I did that one summer. Oh, youth. <laughs> no, I experienced some distressing symptoms last night, so I'm checking my vital signs every hour. I'd be happy to create a chart and participate in a differential diagnosis. Oh, that sounds like fun. <laughs> oh, right. <clears throat> what were the symptoms? Elevated heart rate, moist palms, dry mouth, and localized vascular throbbing. <laughs> localized to what region? Ears and genitalia. Interesting. It's not body parts that usually team up. <laughs> what about environmental factors? Describe the scene for me. I was sitting in a restaurant with Penny and Bernadette drinking water, carbonated as it was a special occasion. <laughs> Penny's friend Zach stopped by and said hello, and I said, who? Who? Zach. Then why did you ask? Ask what? Who? Zach. All right, let's start over. What did you say when Zach walked in? Who? Zach. Why do you keep saying Zach? Because you keep saying who. I'm not saying who now. I said who last night. And the answer was Zach, correct? There was no question. I simply said who. All right, I think I have enough to go on. Possible explanations for your symptoms are, in descending order of likelihood, hyperthyroidism, premature menopause, hosting an alien parasite, or, and I only include it for the sake of covering absolutely all bases, sexual arousal. Where would I have picked up an alien parasite? Now, the secondary assessment varies depending on that patient's level of consciousness. If they're responsive, you're able to go and focus on that chief complaint. If they're unresponsive, you need to do some detective work, do a more thorough exam, and looking at those physical findings, doing that detective work, trying to figure out what has put them in that current condition. components of that secondary assessments is taking the history of the present illness everything that's going on with them currently and also getting a past medical history because that past medical history may tie directly into that current present illness or injury perform a physical exam of course examining everything on uh, that you can see is wrong with them or the, what the chief complaint is from the patient if they are alert otherwise head to toe assessment if they're unable to tell you or they're unresponsive, obtaining those baseline vital signs and administering interventions and transporting that patient. To be able to get the history of the present illness, generally you're able to get that from the patient. If you're unable to, you can get that from a family or bystanders or healthcare providers, people like that. But you may get into that instance where you just find somebody that Nobody's around, nobody knows anything about them, and then all the real hard work begins. So with some of that, you can find histories of a patient's condition by such things as medical ID bracelets, identification wallets may have 
medical cards or a um, some older people will carry a list of their medications and allergies in their wallet just as they've been told to by their doctors for many many years so with that history you're getting the chief complaint that's why the person called 911 and what's their primary complaint when you're asking this you need to ask open-ended questions ask them what's going on don't give them ideas of what's wrong don't say does your neck hurt does this hurt does this hurt let them tell you what's wrong let them paint the picture for you you don't need to paint the picture for them and let them agree or disagree so getting that history starting with a mnemonic of OPQRST onset how did it start you know what were you doing really when all this began provocation anything make it worse you know if somebody's having chest pains does raising your arms in the air make it worse if you're having chest pains and raising the arm up in the air if that makes it worse you know is, then is it a muscular issue or a true cardiac issue quality using adjectives to describe the pain or discomfort is it sharp burning stabbing ask them to just be able to describe it what it feels like region or radiation where exactly in it does it go anywhere else now know with that radiation is if say in the example somebody having chest pains and it goes into their shoulder and their neck that's radiation if they happen to have pain in their chest and also in the right shoulder to where essentially the area of pain isn't connected that is reference pain some organs in the body if they hurt can cause reference pain just by sharing of nerve pathways so if they're having abdominal pain and shoulder pain but those there isn't pain in between those that's just reference pain severity how bad is the pain on a scale of one to ten ten being the worst pain they've ever had and what is the worst so you need to ask that kind of put it in reference because some people may have never been in pain the worst pain they may have experienced is a splinter so to them this may be a ten to them they're having chest pains most common reference you're going to get, especially from women, or always from the women, is the worst pain they've ever had is child labor. If they say it's worse than labor, it's a legitimate severe pain. And then time, when exactly did it start? So a lot of these questions are going to have to be tailored because, say for instance, quality, it'd be hard to kind of describe discomfort of, say, difficulty in breathing something you could ask you know how does this relate in comparison to other ones the past medical history using a mnemonic a sample signs and symptoms signs is what you see is wrong with the patient so a sign the patient's unresponsive or a sign the patient's foot is beside their head from a traumatic injury and symptoms that's what the patient tells you allergies what they are allergic to this doesn't only mean just medicines it can be seasonal environmental things like the person having difficulty in breathing at the Chinese restaurant who happens to be allergic to shellfish that is a pertinent allergy medications what medications are they currently on and pertinent to past history now don't ask people open-ended questions like do you have high blood pressure because they may say no I don't and they may not because they're taking medication for it so if they don't know names of medications or the history you can ask what do you take medicine for the last oral intake when's the last time they ate how long ago was it this is a big one that's really pertinent to GI issues or endocrine issues such as diabetes if they have low blood sugar and it's been a long time since they've ate that's very pertinent and events leading to the illness you know what were you doing when all this happened chronic issues going on are they smokers for having difficulty in breathing things of that nature you're gonna have to tailor some questions to that physical exam so important information can be obtained by tailoring those questions to the chief complaint you know, a person having chest pains once you've got all the pertinent history and stuff saying hey have you ever had any episodes like this before and say yes 
I had pains like this in 1996. Well, what did the doctor say then? I had a heart attack. So, given some comparisons to everything, kind of tailoring his questions, going a little bit off the normal segue of the OPQRST and sample mnemonics, and then the body systems approach, focusing questions and the examinations on that particular body system that's most likely involved. So the patient having difficulty in breathing, listening to lung sounds, checking their oxygen saturations, and just seeing if they have any kind of lung or breathing history, if they, if they smoke, if they've had any kind of environmental exposures, things like that. Just kind of build the questions off. Don't get too lost in the sauce of trying to ask those tailored questions and forget to ask all the other stuff that will help you paint the big picture of what's going on with the patient. Once you've obtained all their back history, then you get the baseline vital signs. That's a major, major part to getting the full assessment of the patient. After that, this is what you're building everything off of. So later vital signs that you take, you know, five minutes for that unstable person or 10 or 15 minutes for the stable patient will kind of help you develop what the trend is going on with the patient. Now talk about the specific body system examinations. That's where the secondary assessment should begin of the affected system. For instance, a difficulty in breathing, focusing on lung sounds, checking their breathing, seeing if their tidal volume was adequate, checking oxygen saturations, that our mental status, checking blood pressure, the blood glucose, their heart rates, their oxygen saturations, chest pain, checking heart rates, blood pressures, things like that, just kind of tailoring and getting more specific to what's affected most. So that secondary assessment begins with what could possibly be affected and that will help you with your differential diagnosis. General assessment, assessing that mental status versus what's normal. Is it altered to you or is it truly altered to them? The patient who says that they are Abraham Lincoln, for the past 15 years they may have thought they are Abraham Lincoln. So to them, that is normal. That's not altered from their normal mental status. Getting that history of existing conditions, determining medications have been taken as prescribed or any new medications. So when you're asking about what medicines are on, ask if they've had any recent changes to their prescriptions or if they are taking them as they're supposed to. A lot of times you can start to find that a patient's condition may be exacerbated because they're not taking their medicines or they haven't had a chance to get their prescription filled, so on. And determine if those signs and symptoms match anything in the past. Having those breathing problems, anything like this happened to you in the past or similar related chest pains, things of that nature. A respiratory assessment of the physical exam checking the level of how bad the respiratory distress may be, checking the chest wall motion. You want to check, make sure that equal rise and fall of the chest, listening to lung sounds, use the pulse ox, looking for edema in the hands, the ankles, or just globally. So if somebody having difficulty in breathing, you know, listen to lung sounds, be looking at their feet and their ankles and their wrists, see if they're retaining any fluid because there could be a good chance if they're building up fluid in their extremities, it could be in the lungs as well, and checking for fever. Fever is always an infection. So if they're having a high fever and difficulty in breathing, things like pneumonia, other things will tie into that. Examining the cardiovascular system. Looking for anything that could be severe. So getting that, checking the pulse, blood pressures, real quick things, seeing if those are within normal limits. So immediately checking that pulse of the patient, having any kind of possible issues that could relate to that heart rate, seeing if it's within normal limits, and then in that secondary assessment, get a true accurate pulse or a heart rate by the monitor or by palpation. Looking for jugular vein distension. If they have this big engorged veins on the side of their neck, that could mean that there's an issue with cardiovascular compromise to where those big jugular veins are dumping blood back into the heart. So if hearts have a pumping issue, that blood can back up and cause JVD. And when you examine JVD, you want the patient to be positioned at a 45 degree angle. So that semi fowler's position on your cot. If they're laying flat, a lot of times that can cause JVD. But for sitting upright, 
or to a 45 degree semi angle and have JVD, that's a very pertinent finding. Palpating on the chest, if they're having those chest pains to see, if you push on the chest, if it makes it worse, then maybe it could be pulled muscle, something like that. And using that OPQRST to be describing that chest pain, getting that quality and the radiation or the region and that severity, kind of trying to paint the picture of what's going on with their heart. And determining specific characteristics of the pain. You know, if they bend over, does it make it worse? Or if they're moving one way, does it make it worse? If they take a deep breath, is it worse? Just trying to get that big picture pain out of all the issues going on. Performing the neurological assessment, perform a stroke skill. If they've got, if they can stick their arms up in the air and hold them equally, if they can smile without any kind of facial droop, and if they can talk without any kind of slurred speech, are the basic elements of stroke skill. Checking peripheral sensation and movement. Do sensations to each side of the body feel the same, or the top feel the same as the lower? Making sure that the left arm is tingling and the right arm feels fine or their lower extremities tingle and the upper extremities are fine. Feeling along that spine, see if you can see anything that could cause neurological issues. Maybe they've had a vertebrae go out of place from a traumatic injury or they could have completely fractured a spine. Checking their strength of the extremities and when checking the sensations and the strength, we do that equally. So. Have them squeeze fingers at the same time with both hands. Have them push down with their feet or wiggle their toes both at the same time. Seeing if left versus right side are normal. Checking those pupils for equality and reactivity. You know, perla pupils are equal and round or reactive to light. And also, again, if you find something abnormal and they are responsive, make sure that it's just not some kind of chronic issue. For instance, older populations have cataracts or patients blind to one eye will definitely skew that pupil reactivity. And then once again, figuring out what is the normal status of their medical history. With assessment of the endocrine system, the most notable patient you're going to find in this is going to be the diabetic. So first and foremost, always checking the mental status of that patient. It's going to start cluing you in if there is major issues. And checking their skin is always A, B's, and C's and then checking that blood glucose level see if it's within normal limits if it is and are still unresponsive having issues with that differential diagnosis you can be scratching that stuff out also looking for indicators of the patient of whether they have an insulin pump if they've got some kind of medical alert bracelet saying that they're a diabetic checking medications things run like that just kind of doing that detective work and then be asking when that last oral intake was With the GI assessment, observe that patient's position. See how they're holding themselves. If they're doubled over, holding their abdomen, if they're laying on their side in the fetal position, whatever, that can kind of give you the, what disposition a patient's in of how critical their GI issues may be. And then where you start with the possible prim primarily affected system, checking that abdomen. That's where all the GI organs are at, so check out the belly. So if they are having pain in a certain region of their abdomen, that's the area you're going to assess last. If they're having pain in one area, the last thing you need to do is poke them in that area and then try to assess the rest of the belly. They'll start guarding, having their arms covered up over their stomach and not let you assess everything else. Also, be inspecting anything else you may see. If they're having, uh, if they've thrown up and you see it, you can be looking, see if there's any vomit or excuse me, any blood in the vomit, or if they're having fecal issues, passing blood through their stool, anything like that. Now, older people will definitely, if they have something wrong with their poop, they're going to leave it in the toilet. So when you get there, they'll tell you it's still in there if you want to go look at it. Now, if they're starting to pass blood, things like that, or if they're, uh, say they're puking up coffee ground looking stuff, you're going to want to see that stuff because that is really pertinent stuff. Now, saying that, it doesn't mean you have to go and package up their poop and take it to the hospital with you. It's not like the veterinarian. You don't have to take poop for them to examine it. So, looking at that vomit, see if you see anything crazy in it or if it, uh, say, does look like ground-up coffee grounds. 
that's generally blood. So ground up coffee grounds, upper GI issues, that's upper GI bleed. Or if they've their stool looks really, really dark, they can have, be bleeding somewhere internally. Also, if they're passing blood, seeing if there's bright red blood in the toilet, or if they're just getting a little bit of blood wherever they wipe from, say, maybe a hemorrhoid or something like that. So also tailor those questions asking when or how many bowel movements they had or when the last one was, the consistency of it, if they've got diarrhea, if they're constipated, things like that, or with their vomit, how many times have they thrown up, are they actually getting stuff up or just dry heaving. Assessing an issue with an immune system, inspect that area of point of contact with an allergen. So this may mean that the person got in contact with a plant or a bee, something like a something that's causing major allergic reactions. So checking that skin for hives, checking swelling around the face, lips, and mouth, anything that could possibly compromise that airway, and be listening to lungs to ensure that they're not going to go into a full anaphylactic reaction having difficulty in breathing with wheezing and things like that. So with the physical exam of musculoskeletal injuries, looking for any signs of injury, anything that sticks out right away, then also after that, after you look, you're going to go and touch, be checking for that DCAT BTLS of anything of the suspected injury. So looking, seeing if you feel any bumps, bruising, or note any deformities, or see angulations or movement of places that aren't supposed to be moving and then comparing that left side to the right side seeing what is supposed to be normal or if anything crazy sticks out looking for any kind of possible prior injuries you know if they have any hardware implanted if you see any major scars then they could have potentially had surgeries because you know those surgery surgical joints and bones and hardware are always susceptible to reoccurring injuries and ask if a patient takes any kind of blood thinning medication, you know, whether they're taking it from a heart condition or whatever. If they've sustained a traumatic injury, this blood thinning medication could cause some major issues, whether it's internal or external bleeding, could make that simple injury much, much worse. Also, asking and trying to do your detective work to see if possibly a medical problem caused that traumatic injury. Did the person who wrecked the car and is unresponsive, did they become unresponsive because they wrecked the car, or did they wreck the car because they went unresponsive? Let's talk about assessing of the unresponsive patient, the person who can't answer any of your questions that really makes you put on that CSI detective hat. You've got to do a rapid physical exam. You're going head to toe, checking out everything, starting at the head, checking the neck, the chest, the abdomen, and the pelvis, all the extremities, and on the back side. So at the neck, you're looking for that JVD, any kind of medical identification devices of necklaces, things like that. In the chest, you're looking for breast sounds, looking for equal rise and fall of the chest, doing quick uh, feeling around of if you make sure the ribs are in line, checking that breath, the breast sounds. And then the abdomen, looking for anything that seems abnormal, whether the belly's really stuck out and it feels firm or kind of rigid, meaning that there could be possibly blood built up into the abdomen. Checking the pelvis, seeing if it's stable, any kind of traumatic stuff there. Check and see if you see any kind of incontinence of urine or feces or possibly any kind of bleeding in extremities. Checking for pulse, motor function. You know, most everybody's kind of ticklish on their feet, so you can swipe around the feet, see if the toes move. A lot of times, if they're unresponsive, neurologically, they could still be intact. Could be a little, uh, just some neurological reflexes make those toes curl. Or if you do a little bit of pain flicking, um, see if they respond to any kind of painful stimuli in the feet. Uh, checking for oxygen saturation, put that pulse ox on them, see if you got good perfusion. And once again, checking for any kind of medical ID things, say a bracelet, or I've seen patients having tattoos on their arms even. And then check those pupils. See if they're unresponsive because of a neurological issue or a drug issue. And then getting those baseline vital signs of a pulse, respiration rate, 
checking skin color temperature condition looking at the pupils are they perla equal and round reactive to light with accommodation checking the blood pressure just trying to take note of any kind of abnormalities and then be considering an ALS backup unresponsive patient can't figure out why they're unresponsive or they need an intervention that you can't supply call for a paramedic or if you even need a higher care than that call for a helicopter just depending on that geographical area and what the best care is going to be for that patient getting the history of their present illness you know what's their name what happened Did anybody witness this what's going on uh, did the patient say anything for the winter response? I was just trying to put on that full detective hat, see anything that's going on. If you can get any kind of information from the bystanders prior to transporting, because you need to be able to ask all those questions. Because once you start to transport, you can't just turn around and go back whenever you have a question. Try to get as many questions answered as you can without delaying patient care before you get them to the hospital. Then administer any kind of interventions for quick life-saving things, you know, if needed, immobilize them, ventilate them, whatever you may need to do to help stabilize them prior to transporting. Now for the detailed physical exam. This is generally done en route to the hospital. This is doing a more thorough examination of the patient, just complements that primary secondary assessment and once again this is done after all critical interventions so it's a little bit slower more methodical you gotta expose that patient seeing if anything crazy is going on if they have any kind of medication patches that are on making them unresponsive that they forgot to take off their fentanyl patch before they put on another one and now they've accidentally overdosed so get them naked Doing a full examination will help you just try to do further detective work. So it's just kind of like doing that rapid trauma assessment head to toe. You just go a little bit slower, more detailed, and focus in a little bit more. Reassessment. So you need to be reassessing that patient to help develop a trend, everything that's going on. You can't just do everything once and then that be it and then just sit there. As I said, there should be none of those Ricky Bobby moments where you're just sitting there twiddling your thumbs. You don't know what to do with your hands. Always be doing some kind of assessment, trying to figure something out. So those reassessments always ongoing. So that may mean you completely redo your entire primary assessment. So you're going to be looking for trends. Are they getting better? Are they getting worse? Just completely repeating that primary assessment. On a pediatric note, that mental status of the unresponsive patient can be checked by just doing by yelling or flicking the feet. We don't need to give little kids sternal rubs or try to reduce a lot of pain. So if you have a kid crying, that's good. Kids are supposed to cry, that's what they do. So that may not necessarily mean that it's an uh, inadequate mental status and for just crying for no reason. Well, if they're crying, it means they've got an airway. So. You'll start to realize that sometimes a crying baby is a good baby. Now in that reassessment, you're going to repeat pertinent assessments of the affected organs and of that physical exam. So that chief complaint may change, and especially in a traumatic injury, that patient, once the adrenaline wears off, they could start to develop more pain in different areas, things like that. or that chest pain could develop further in from chest pain to difficulty in breathing also or a change of mental status. So always ongoing reassessing the patient, checking their symptoms, seeing if they're changing, getting any better, checking those vital signs. Checking the interventions you performed. Is the oxygen you're delivering them, is their oxygen saturation improving and helping their uh, work of breathing is their ventilation is if you are artificially ventilating them is that helping improve their condition or their vital signs does the bleeding as you just wrapped up is it being controlled are you effectively managing it and just seeing anything that you possibly done is it improving getting worse always keeping an eye on it when observing and trying to develop a trend it's good to know that it takes at least three sets of vital signs to develop that trend. 
because there's always that human error that can go into everything that you know, maybe the noise ambulance, that second blood pressure wasn't quite accurate. So that's why we repeat everything ongoing to even rule out our human error. So always write this stuff down so you can remember if you're trying to do be tracking that trend. So those trends may indicate that you need to change your interventions or everything you've done is getting better or what you're doing could potentially be making them worse. Recessing of the patients every 15 minutes for the stable patient and every 5 minutes for an unstable patient or the patient who could potentially become unstable or if they were once at one point unstable but are now stable, continue to check them every 5 minutes. Some little notes of how an EMT can learn to think like that experienced physician. You need to learn to love ambiguity. You know, take those blinders off. No two patients are going to be the same. So continually be thinking outside the box. Doing that good detective work. Paint the entire picture of everything going on with your patient. Also understand that there are human errors and technological errors. That maybe the monitor had an error. Maybe that pulse ox just doesn't want to work right. Or maybe you goofed up checking that pulse rate or taking that blood pressure. All this is going to help you form a good foundation of knowledge. The more experience you get in the field, the better and the smarter you're going to become. You need to utilize every call as a learning experience. Every single call you go on, there will be a takeaway from it. Even the most trivial type of call, it's good practice and just another way to be building up your knowledge base of being an excellent pre-hospital care provider.